Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John, and it's chapter 14, verses 23 through 31. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send to my name, send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Here ends the reading of God's word. Pentecost, it is a festival day. In the church calendar, all of the festivals, all of the highest festivals, things like Christmas and and the ascension of Jesus Christ, Easter, all of them happen during this first half of the church calendar. Today is really the last day of the first half of the calendar. The next half of the calendar switches to what some call ordinary time or trinity. But today, my point is, is today is a festival. It's a day that stands next to Christmas and Easter as being some of the most vital days in the history of salvation because it is on this day that God the Father and the Son sent God the Holy Spirit to be with and empower and to enlighten the disciples. The Holy Spirit is the gift of Pentecost. What kind of festival would it be without gifts, right? And the gift of the Holy Spirit, as we see, is Jesus Christ. Jesus' gift of the Holy Spirit is a priceless gift to us, to the church. It's through the Holy Spirit's work that you are called to the gospel. You are called by the gospel and you are enlightened with his gifts, sanctified and kept in the true faith. If it weren't for the Holy Spirit, none of us would be here. That's kind of the point. In Jesus' conversation that we see in John chapter 14, this is right before the high priestly prayer. This is right before Gethsemane. Jesus is talking to them about the Holy Spirit, about the comforter who will come, but not just the comforter, but the helper. And it's especially on this conversation we're going to meditate on today, considering God's word and what Jesus says to his disciples Here, Jesus reveals three characteristics of the Holy Spirit, which we will consider. First, in verse 26, we see that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of light. Our world is filled with darkness. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 19, that people love the darkness. They're attracted to it because darkness provides cover for their sin. It provides cover for their evil thoughts, their words, and their deeds. It's in the darkness where people do the most evil things. Even if it's not in the darkness of the world, but in the darkness of their own hearts. Darkness is the veil of lies that shrouds the world that keeps people from the truth. Darkness is the words of Satan in the garden saying, did God really say? Darkness is following after false teachings And following after personalities instead of after God in his word. Darkness is twisting the scriptures to fit your own reason and your own agendas. It's darkness that causes people inside and outside of the church to cover up the sins of others and of their their own. It's darkness that causes men and women to not stand up for what is right. People love darkness their darkness. Sometimes we get caught up in this idea that people should feel ashamed of their sin and 
And because of the work of the, of the law, people do at times feel shame for their sin and they, they turn to God and his word. But not always. People love their sin. People love to do evil. They love the darkness. That's Jesus' own words. They love the darkness. They love to, to commit evil. It's the wickedness in man and men and women's hearts that lead them to this conclusion that they're better off without God, that they're better off without an objective moral good in the world. And to combat this darkness, Jesus sends forth the light, the light of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, who is the light of the world, sends forth his spirit to be a light, to illuminate the world in order to bring truth into the darkness. After spending three years with Jesus, it's no wonder that Jesus thought that he needed to send the Holy Spirit, especially to help and to teach the disciples. You see, they had spent three years with him, and there was no way that Jesus actually probably expected them to remember the words of the Sermon on the Mount, or to actually remember all the things that they said and did verbatim. Because who could do this? After this sermon is over, I who spent hours putting this together and thinking about it and and listening to myself read it out loud, I probably won't be able to replicate with exactness this sermon as soon as I'm done. There's no way that the apostles could have done this. And so Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. And he sends the Holy Spirit to teach them everything that they need to know concerning salvation. And also to remind them of all of the things that Jesus said and all of the things that he did. And we have the fulfillment of this promise in our very hands today as we grab our Bibles and we look at God's recorded word written down for us to consider that the Holy Spirit breathed the words of Scripture into the apostles and they wrote them down. And so we look at our Bibles not as a book that has been compiled by by various men over centuries, but instead as God's word breathed out, verbally inspired. And because God is the author, that means it cannot fail and it will not fail. And that it is true. The fulfillment of the promise of, of what Jesus is saying here is not some mystery. It's a book you can buy. It's the most widely printed book in all of the history of of the printing press. It's the bestseller of all time. And it's God's word. God, the creator of heaven and earth, spoke. And the words were written down for you and for me. The scriptures, therefore, are sufficient. There's nothing else that needs to be added. Otherwise, Jesus is not telling the truth and saying that the Holy Spirit will teach everything they need. If, if it's not sufficient, then, then why, would, why would Jesus go through any of this at all? There's nothing that you can add to it. There's nothing that you should add to it that will help you when it comes to your salvation. We don't look elsewhere We don't need to search our our feelings or look for some other revelation to come through, through dreams or anything of that nature. We have God's word right here, spoken to us, given to us for our good and for our salvation. The Holy Spirit, in teaching and reminding the apostles of everything they need, did everything that we need as well. And Therefore, we can join with the chorus of the psalmist, In Psalm 119, who says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And when God's word illuminates the lives of Christians, and when it illuminates the path of Christians as they gather together, there is nothing else that we need to help us to understand what it means to be a church. There's nothing else that we need to help us understand what it means to be a Christian, to live out what Jesus has said, and to believe what he has said. God be praised for the illuminating work of the Spirit of light, the Holy Spirit whom he has promised. And let us cling to it and never let go. The second characteristic of the Holy Spirit we see from Jesus here in John 14 is that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of love. Why did God the Father and Jesus send the Spirit? It's because he loves you. Because he loves the apostles. 
Because he wants you to believe. And then the Holy Spirit bringing forth the love of God to those who hear creates faith in those who hear this word. The Holy Spirit's work is very simple. It's to usher in precious eternal human souls into the light of God, into his love. He does this by calling, gathering, enlightening, and sanctifying the whole church on earth through his word. This happens through his word. Make no mistake. As we think about what it means to be a church, one of the things it means to be a church is to proclaim the gospel, the word of God, the forgiveness of sins for the sake of Jesus Christ. And it's in this way that the Holy Spirit works to sanctify you, to sanctify me, to make us clean, to make us holy. So we don't have to rely on our own works. We have God's work who's doing it for us. God is cleaning us even now. We trust in him to do what he promises. And just as the Holy Spirit causes the apostles to record God's word, the Holy Spirit also calls the people of God through the preaching of that very word. There's an important distinction for us to see here that we're just starting to touch in upon. And that distinction is between salvation won and salvation applied. That Jesus Christ on the cross, dying for your sins, completes the work that is necessary for the forgiveness of your sins. There is nothing else that can be done. There is nothing else that is acceptable. It is Jesus Christ's blood upon the cross by which you are saved. But this salvation does not apply to you until you have faith, until you are believing. And to do this work, the Holy Spirit comes forth and applies the forgiveness of sins to you through the preaching of the word of God. And this preaching is not just the sermon portion of the service. It's through the hearing of God's word throughout the service, all the way from the very beginning, the first words that we say to the very end. When we hear the benediction, it's through the receiving of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, which is given for you for the forgiveness of sins. It's through receiving the waters of baptism, where God says that he washes you and renews you through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. This is what God does for you. He takes the blood of Christ upon the cross and he says, this is now yours. His righteousness is yours. You are forgiven because of what he has done. The Holy Spirit then offers this salvation to you. And it is apprehended by faith, which he brings forth in you. He plants it in you. He gives you the water. He gives you the sunlight. And it grows into full maturity. God does all of this. Willing your salvation. Winning your salvation. And applying your salvation. Because of his great love for you. The natural outcome of God's grace and love for a believer then is to love God in return. The love of God in our hearts is an invisible thing, but the love of God does not remain invisible in the life of a believer. Instead, it overflows into their lives as they keep the word of Jesus. The word in our text for keeping the word of Jesus is actually much stronger than what keep would imply. Some translations will translate it as obey, but even that does not do it justice. The word that I would use to understand it is to guard. It's to stand sentry, to be at your post, protecting it, watching over it. What does this look like in our lives? Literally, it means, I think, not to lose the word. If something is in your guard, if it's in your keep, then then your job is to not lose it. Don't let it be altered. Don't let it be changed. Instead, preserve it just as the way that it is. Christians are to be sentries over this treasure that is the word of God. But this isn't restricted just to purely theological arguments and and exhortations on the third person of the Trinity. But this is very, very practical for you and for me this morning. When a Christian is tempted to sin to not help her neighbor and who is in need... It is the love of God, that the love that God has for her, that reminds her to guard the words of Christ. And what that means is it reminds the Christian to not violate that word, to guard it, to protect it, to protect the integrity of it 
both as it is, but also in their, that Christian's own life. The love of God then overflows, not just in not sinning, but then actually going and seeking the welfare of your neighbor. And so that means when you see someone who is in need, you rise and you help. It means when you see that your neighbor is suffering and is in pain, you seek to alleviate it. It means when you see that they're hungry, it means you give them food. When they lack clothing, you give them clothes. It means that you can't be keeping God's word and sitting back on your laurels and doing nothing. That our faith is an active faith. We don't trust in this activity to save us. Remember, Jesus' death and resurrection is sufficient. There's nothing to be added to it. We trust in him and his work for our salvation. But he charges us to guard his word, to guard the integrity of his word, and to live our faith, to live it out in love for our neighbors. And so we do, by the grace of God, do these things. And when we fail in these things, when we do sin, when we fail to rise to help our neighbor, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love that calls us to repentance and the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is ours. The third characteristic I see in Jesus' words here in John 14 is found in verses 27 through 28. And there we see that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of peace. Look at the gift Jesus gives to the apostles here in verse 27. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. This peace is not like the peace that the world gives. The world does offer you peace. It says, do this. Change your body. Change your house. Change your car. Buy the, into the newest and latest, greatest thing you've seen on TV. It says champion the latest political, social, or economic issue that we've all agreed upon is best. The peace the world offers to you points in every direction. And it says, do this, and you'll have peace. This can be clearly seen on a bookshelf at Barnes & Noble or any other place where you would buy books. You can see it in the headlines in the news. You can see it in the opinion pages and in blogs throughout the internet. It tells you what to do. Every every year a new book sweeps the nation and a new trend comes along promising happiness and peace. It says things like clean out your house and go minimal. Or it says buy a van and go live in that van. Or it says leave your neighbors and go and do your own thing. It says, stop apologizing for the things that you have done wrong and move on with your life. Do what makes you happy. You you may find some happiness and peace if that is what you're chasing. If you're trying to find peace in the world, you might have a feeling of peace at some time based on the things that you do. Some of the wisdom of the world, properly applied, can be extraordinarily beneficial. It's a good thing to clean out your house from every once in a while, to clean out the closets, is it not? It's a good thing to think about your neighbors and think about those who you live with and maybe the mess you leave behind on the kitchen table. Yes, it's a good thing. And we can do those things and give thanks to God that he has shown us these things to do in order to love one another. But the target always moves, doesn't it? Every year there's a new book. Every day there's going to be a new blog post. There's going to be a new issue to champion. The target will always move. The peace that the world offers through these things is not peace that endures. Because it's not real peace. It's not based in reality. It's a whitewash. It's a polishing of a pig pen. It goes away. As soon as you let the pigs back in, it's, it's dirty and messy again. All the world has to offer you is the law. The world offers you, do this, do that, and once you've done it, do this next thing. Here's something else for you to do. The peace that the Holy Spirit offers you is the peace of Jesus Christ. It is his peace. Instead of saying, do this, Jesus says, it is finished. 
I have done it. It's completed. Instead of chasing after this peace, this peace is given to you as a gift. This peace is not just a feeling of peace that's here today and gone tomorrow. It is an objective state of peace between you and God. It's the peace of the garden on that sixth day. When God said it is very good, the Hebrews have a word for peace. It's shalom. It's that peace which God promises in paradise. And this peace Jesus gives to his disciples. He says it's unlike anything that you will ever get in the world. This is a peace that can only come from God himself. This peace which is real does bring forth feelings of peace though. It's not as if It's a reality that we know nothing of. We experience this peace when we rest in Jesus Christ. When we say, it it is finished. I, I don't have to do these things in order to save my soul, in order to have peace with God. It's that peace. This peace, yes, it it can flee from times in our anxious hearts and our anxious minds. It can flee when we look at headlines and we see the terrible evil that happens in the world, whether we're looking at wars in the Middle East or or turmoil in our politics or when we see foster children like we just saw this morning on the news who are sleeping in cars and are being deprived of blankets. It's a terrible thing that we see this But despite all of these evil things, the peace that God has given to us through his son, Jesus Christ, that has been applied to us through the Holy Spirit, it does not go away. Just as we're called to guard the word that is given to us, God guards the peace which he has won for us himself. And God, we learn, is a mighty warrior here. He's the Lord of hosts. He he commands armies of saints and angels, and he guards your salvation. We see glimpses of this peace recorded for us in Scripture, and I don't think there's probably one that's more memorable than Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the peace that God gives to you. Peace that endures forever. The Holy Spirit is the gift of Pentecost. The spirit of light, of love, and peace comes to you and to all the world through the word of God. The gift of the Holy Spirit is one of the most gracious things God can give to us because it's through this gift, through the third person of the Trinity, that Jesus Christ and his righteousness is given to you. You who believe in Jesus Christ, you who have been baptized, you walk in this spirit of light. You live in this love and you will die in this peace. And this peace surpasses understanding and it guards your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus Christ. Our striving is ended, the battle is won. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning and will be forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 125, Come, O Come, Thou Quickening Spirit. And would you stand and sing?